All right, so good evening, and thank you everyone for joining us on this warm July evening for our second Draper After Dark presentation of 2019. Couple quick announcements. Um, please just silence or turn off your cell phones and electronic devices. Um, we're grateful for the support of the Nancy Carroll Draper Foundation as well as Sage Creek Ranch, which has enabled the Buffalo Bill Center of the West as well as the Draper Natural History Museum to offer programs like the Lunchtime Expedition Speaker Series and the Draper After Dark programs. The quality and the caliber of speakers that the Center and the Draper are able to attract has only been made possible through the generous support of our partners, and we hope to continue delivering high quality content far into the future. These lectures are being recorded and they're being uploaded to our Draper YouTube channel. So if you've missed any of our previous talks and speakers, you can find their talks and presentations along with the previous uh, years as well from 2018. So today we're going to hear from Dr. Anthony Carogillo. Anthony is the Assistant Director of Genomic Operations at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Anthony has worked at AMNH since 2010, where he began conducting his dissertation research on the population and conservation genetics of mountain lions in Central and South America. Originally from Brooklyn, New York, Anthony received his Bachelor's of Arts in Biology from Colgate University, his Master's from Villanova University, and his PhD from Fordham University. Anthony's main research involves using genetic and genomic techniques to study populations of a variety of species, including mountain lions, jaguars, snow leopards, humpback whales, and coyotes. Anthony is keenly interested in utilizing historic and ancient DNA in his research. And before we get into Anthony's talk, I just want to mention one thing. Um, it was actually Anthony's PhD work with mountain lions that drove me to pursue a master's of ecology in ultimately how I came to do research and work with a natural history museum. There's a lot of people that helped me get to where I am today, um, but Anthony was and still remains one of those pivotal mentors of mine. So please give Dr. Carajula a warm welcome. All right, well, thanks, Corey, for that warm introduction, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, so like Corey said, uh, I'm going to be talking about one of, my, one of my interests in my research is using museum collections uh, to understand contemporary, in contemporary studies to understand species. Okay. So like Corey said, I work at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Uh, and that's where I got my first taste of using museum collections. The, the museum has over 34 million specimens in our collection, uh, spanning all of the diversity of life. And it was here that I first started using uh, museum collections in my, in my PhD research and where I continue to try and leverage and use some of those collections in, in my work. So most of my work, like Corey said, is in conservation population genetics research, uh, primarily using non-invasive techniques. So I use a lot of of scat samples to study my organisms. And like, uh, I've, I've studied humpback whales, jaguars, coyotes, um, and a lot of things. But today I'm gonna kind of change focus and talk to you mainly about museum collections and how technologies in, in, uh, in DNA, in genetics, and in computational, in the computational realm have really helped us use museum collections to answer a lot of questions and, and the great utility that they have and kind of the un, um, undertapped resource that they are. So collections are the foundation of our scientific knowledge. Um, a lot of evolutionary relationships, taxonomy, systematics, uh, a lot of comparative work has been done using, using collections. Uh, people have collect collected skins, bones, and, and researchers have been able to go in and look at the similarities and differences between all of those to understand how things are related. Um, and these collections represent an assemblage of a whole bunch of the diversity of life and have a ton of associated data with them. They have years they were collected, where they were collected, collection conditions. I um, mean, this all speaks to the power of these, of these collections as a preservation of, an, in a, of a snapshot in history. And so the value of collections has increased. Uh, previously, it had been you would have a, a specimen and be able to only get a limited amount of information from it, usually taking measurements on the bones or skin coloration, um, and only being able to use that. It's only been recently that we've been able to leverage the genetic information that is there. And it's a, an incredibly useful resource. Uh, collections represent species 
geographic locations of species that don't, where they no longer exist. And so we can go back and look at genetic trends over time um, for species that may not exist, may not exist in those current geographic locations any longer, and be able to use that to help inform current, uh, current decisions. And one of, the, one of the main advances has actually been this, this chart here represents the cost to sequence DNA and how dramatically it has decreased. And so for a while it had followed this trend and this line is called Moore's Law and it's a, it was created by computer scientists and it says that computational power, the power of computers would double every single, um, every single year. And so for a while the cost of genetic sequencing was following that but then it dramatically dropped um, and that's with the advent of next generation sequencing which I will we'll talk to you in a bit. I mean, just to give you a frame of reference, when the human genome was done in about 2000, 2001, it cost $100 million. Uh, and now you can sequence a human genome for about $1,500. Um, and so the, that cost has really opened up a wide array of, use, of usefulness for using collections for genetic work. And partly because of that is because new sequencing technology requires DNA to be chopped up into little pieces which is perfect for using collections and ancient DNA. And so um, ADNA, where you see that, that means ancient DNA or DNA from collections. And so because those samples have been sitting around for a long time, they were collected hundreds to thousands of years ago, uh, what happens to DNA over time is it gets degraded or chopped up into little itty bitty fragments. Um, and so our human genome is about three billion base pairs long, so about three billion A's, T's, C's, and G's long in one contiguous segment. Um, and so we would love for that to be able to be the case, and that's really easy to sequence and work with. But when we're looking at collections, that's been chopped up into little pieces, and so we can't recreate that continuous amount of information. And that's been the big hurdle for using collections for genetic work in the past, is because you'd only, you can only sequence really short pieces at a time, and in order to get any information, you have to, it's, a really, it's really a labor of love. You really have to spend a lot of time sequencing really small bits and then stitching them all together. And if you're trying to get a subset of that three billion base pairs of information, it'll take you a really long time. But what next generation sequencing does, um, and that's what NGS stands for, it fragments it, it requires it to be all fragmented up, and then you just sequence all these little pieces, which is ideal for using collection DNA, and then you recreate it all. And you can sequence millions and millions of A's, T's, C's, and G's at one time. And so the amount of information that you get is just incredibly, uh, incredibly increased, um, which has really allowed for the usefulness of collections for genetic studies. The other big thing has been the, the internet has made collections virtually accessible to anyone. And this is one of, the, one of the pivotal things, is that a lot of museums have been digitizing their collections and making them available online. So you can not only see the actual specimens, and get all the associated data, know who collected it, when it was collected, where it was collected. But a lot of times you can also get sometimes 3D scans or um, morphological data. Uh, you can also know that the museum databases are also online. So for instance, I was just doing a project that I'll talk to you in a little bit about coyotes, and I needed to find coyote skulls from all over the, the US. And I was able to go onto this database, VertNet, that has hundreds of museums collections all on there and just type in Canis Latrans, the scientific name for coyotes, and all, every specimen across the U.S. came up that was in a database. But not all museums have their databases online. And that's, the, that's a real big, an, another pivotal point is that collections are great for pres preserving the information, but you have to share that information to make it really useful to all the researchers. Um, and so the advent of the, well, the ex, explosion of the internet and digitizing and databasing people's collections to make them usable and available to everybody has really made uh, the utility of collections vastly increased. And then it extends, I'm, I'm interested in the genetics and genomics of it, but the utility extends beyond those. I mean, you can, you can use stable isotopes, for instance, and that's where you're looking at the molecular characteristics of usually carbon within certain specimens uh, in their bones, in their skins, in their feathers for birds, and you can recreate environmental conditions uh, from when they were collected. So we can look back and know what the environmental conditions on the earth were hundreds of thousands of years ago just by looking at these specimens in collections. Uh, you can look at their diet and know what they're eating. There was, a, there was a great study that looked at 
birds over, that were collected over the last, uh, last century, and we were able to recreate their diets and see how it changed over, over time. Plus, collections are great. You can do a lot of scans. 3D scanning of, of bones, uh, and then making those publicly available so researchers, any researcher with a 3D printer can print a specimen from any museum if that 3D scan is available online, which is incredible. Uh, that's, such a, that's such an amazing, amazing thing in my mind. Um, plus all those pickled things that people have, all those things in jars of ethanol, which for a while are, don't have limited utility from a genetic standpoint, have great utility because now we can put them in MRI, mas MRI machines or CT scanners and be able to look at all of the internal anatomy. I mean, people have been doing great work looking at uh, the brain cases of different animals and how that's changed over time, especially looking at uh, fossil dinosaurs and how they've uh, how they evolved into birds and how the brain case has changed over time. This is one example, but this has been a really burgeoning area of research that's really, really exciting. Uh, plus, what I think is one of the more amazing uses of collections is that museum collections aided in the discovery of a new mammal species back in 2013. Uh, and so just when we thought we had described all the mammals, we knew them all, um, there were researchers who were working in the Field, field Museum uh, in Chicago and they were looking at alingos, who are a, a group of organisms that are related to raccoons. And so at the time, there were three recognized species. They were looking at them in the drawers. They were looking at skins. They were like, these look kind of different than all the others. Um, and so they looked at them. They looked at the skins. They looked at skull morphology, used molecular data, and found that, wow, these are, these are totally different than the other three species. And we thought they belonged to one of these, but they're actually not. And so they were able to discover the olinguito, uh, maybe you, you remember, it was, it was big in the press back in 2013. And so, and this is, this is a picture of it. It's a cute little guy, lives in the cloud forests in the Andes, uh, known, known to the scientific community, but unknown as a, as a unique species onto itself, and would have remained that way without, the, without looking at museum collections and studying, studying skull morphology, um, looking at skin color. This is it here, and these are the other three species. And so you can see the colorations are, are quite different. Um, but an, an amazing use of collections, um, and especially for discovering a, a new mammalian species, which is just mind-blowing. Uh, and so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift into three kind of broad kind of case studies where I've used collections in my, in my studies. And the first one is going to be from my studies on mountain lions and using, using scat samples to look at their populations through, from Argentina up through uh, the western United States. And so I, the mountain lions are, are my favorite animal uh, for a variety of reasons, but one of, one of which is they have, they hold the Guinness Book of World Records for the most common names. Um, and they have over, I believe they have over 20 common names. Depending on where you are in the world, you call them something, something different. So they're called pumas, mountain lions, cougars, uh, catamounts, panthers, uh, a whole bunch of stuff, uh, mountain ghosts. They're called a whole bunch of stuff, depending on, on where you are. And the etymology of their name is actually pretty interesting. Uh, the word puma derives from a Peruvian Quechua Indian word for powerful animal. Cougar is a combination of two Brazilian words for jaguar. I, ca I can't pronounce these, cuaquara and juaquara, and that became cougar. Uh, and so they're just amazing animals. They also have the widest latitudinal distribution of any vertebrate, excluding humans. They go all the way from Argentina up through, um, up through northern Canada. Um, so they're highly adaptable. They're, they're amazing animals, and they're one of my favorite. Um, and so I decided to, to study them because their populations had been declining mainly because of anthropogenic factors. And so they require large habitat ranges. Uh, they were declining because the habitat was getting fragmented. They were being persecuted by, uh, by humans, uh, being road kills, and so Ranchers and farmers tend to shoot them if they're eating their livestock. Uh, and so they were, they're declining, but not listed as um, threatened by the International Union for the Conservation of, of Nature. Um, also, they're really important because they're an apex predator, um, and they're an umbrella species. And so their conservation and their protection helps protect a whole bunch of stuff in the habitat that they, uh, that they live in. And since it's a large area, that equates to a large number of species that they would help save. So we know a, a ton about mountain lions in the US and in Canada, but not a lot about 
mountain lions in the neotropics. And so, and so for this talk, I, I define neotropics as Mexico, Central America, and South America. Uh, and most people just assumed, and at the, at the time, the people just assumed that whatever applied to North American pumas also applied to Central and South American pumas, even though there are huge differences in climate, habitat, terrain, as well as socioeconomics. One of the biggest things was that the, the population of people has exploded from 1950, it's about 157 million people, to 2,000, 520 million people, and that number just continues to grow. And so the increasing numbers of people, you have increasing amounts of habitat loss for these animals. And so I sought out to try and build kind of baseline information and genetic knowledge on these individuals because understanding their genetic diversity, how they're moving across a landscape, where they're more diverse, where they're less diverse, and how they're moving allows managers on the ground to identify areas where they're connected, build roadways, or build areas and, um, and corridors so that they can move between, between areas and maintain their genetic diversity. Because without ge genetic diversity, uh, you have a higher chance of becoming locally extinct in, in that area. And so I obtained DNA from a whole bunch of, of samples, uh, mainly scat samples that were collected opportunistically, also some blood and tissue samples. Uh, and scat sample is, is, scat is very difficult to also work with for DNA. Uh, these samples in the neotropics have been potentially sitting out in a rainforest for days to weeks to months being rained on, the sun shining on them, animals coming up, sniffing them, licking them, kicking them around. Uh, and so the DNA there is also very challenging to work with because it's also chopped up in the tiny fragments. And so it's, a, it's also another labor of love to get DNA from these. And so, but I was, a, I was a young grad student and thought, you know what, I'll just make my life a little harder. And I also want to look at our museum historical collections and get, look at all the 15 previously described subspecies of mountain lions from all over their range and use those, use those as well. And so uh, this, is, this is just a, a map showing where all of my, all my samples came from. And the range of mountain lions extends from about here all the way up to here. And so I covered it. It's a little patchy, but this was one of the more extensive uh, studies of mountain lions across their, across their range. Um, but one of the more fun parts was going into the museum collection and looking at all these skulls and pelts and actually taking samples from there and trying to get um, DNA from these. And just to give you an idea of the amount of time that it, that it takes, it took a few days to sample all of these, uh, but then to get DNA out of them sometimes takes about one to two weeks just you know, per sample. And we can do a couple of samples at a time, but because they're old and they spanned over from 100 to 50 years old, you want to be really careful because the, you don't want to contaminate the sample. So we only do a few at a time. Um, and so here, this is just, I was able to get a bunch of DNA from um, inside their nasal cavity, they have turbinate bones, and they're these really thin bones um, that are really folded, and that's what gives animals like cats and dogs a great sense of smell, um, because there's a lot of nerve endings in there, and so they're really folded up, a lot of, a lot of bones that are the scaffold for nerves and blood vessels. Um, if you looked at our turbinate bones, they would not look anything like that. They're pretty, pretty simple, but they're a great source of, of DNA. And then I had to throw this picture in here. This was a, a mountain lion it was actually from Vancouver Island um, up in British Columbia that I was super excited about because I thought this was going to be totally different. They'd been on an island. They're going to look different than all the other uh, North American mountain lions. And I picked up the skull, and this thing fell out. And it was like a giant piece of beef jerky. And I was super excited. And it was some piece of dried tissue. And this is, this is like hitting the Mega Millions lottery for collections DNA because this is some dried tissue, probably some muscle tissue or something um, that just has blood, tissue, so much DNA in there compared to anything else. And so this was, this was super exciting. And actually, this was the sample that gave me the best, best quality DNA that I saw in my entire study. Um, but I also, I'm a big proponent of showing people your successes as well as your failures. And so while I'm talking about the great wealth of knowledge that exists in museum collections and getting genetic information. This is also showing how much work went into and how little information that I was able to, actually able to get, but this was also 10 years ago. And so all the, all the cells with no X's mean I got no sequence data. And so this is kind of a Swiss cheese approach. And so I, was, I wasn't able to use a whole bunch of these samples that I was able to collect. In the end, I was only able to look at, use actually four samples out of 
um, the 15 or 16 or so that I was able to get DNA from. But the cool thing was that I was able to look back and reconstruct their evolutionary history on, um, on in North and Central and South America. And the, all we're looking at here is that this is just a what's called a haplotype network. And all a haplotype is, is if you look at a DNA sequence, there are unique sequences that identify groups. And so, you know, humans in the U.S. would have one suite of signatures, one sequence of A's, T's, C's, and G's that would differentiate them potentially from Central America and South America and even different countries. And so this is a similar thing to what you'd get back from a, a service like Ancestry DNA or 23andMe that would look, th look at your unique suite of differences that can pinpoint your geographic origins. And so the, the cool thing was that we were able to look and see that one important thing, the blue dots are all South American mountain lions, meaning that that's where they originated from because those had the most genetic diversity, meaning they were able to evolve there for the longest period of time. Um, then we were able to see that the yellow, the Central America, is where they then moved upwards to, and then North America is the youngest group. Uh, but the museum collections were really important because they informed that there was really no big differences within the last 150 years, um, which may or may not be surprising. They're long-lived organisms. You know, the generation time is usually 10 to 15 years, and so that equates to about 10 or so generations, uh, which may not be enough time for uh, genetic change to, be, to come about. But, but it may also, and this is a great example of showing that uh, conservation efforts are really working, and they're actually pretty, pretty able to get to each other. And so they're doing relatively well, and museum collections were able to inform that. Um, and here you're, sh you're seeing kind of the same thing just mapped onto geography. And all the different colors are those same, all those different haplotypes, so those different DNA sequences. Um, and the, the main takeaway here is that that one individual from Vancouver Island looked just like all the other North American mountain lions. And I was kind of disappointed in that. I wanted, to be a, I wanted it to be a great discovery, but um, in the end it wasn't. But it was a great, great experience. So, you know, I hope this, this shows one area where museum collections can be really informative uh, and able to fill in some gaps and look at things over the past, uh, over their evolutionary past. So the second thing project I want to talk to you about is using museum collections to look at potential hybridization of urban coyotes in the New York City area. And so coyotes have been expanding across uh, have been expanding across North America for the last 50 or 60 years. They originated from the Midwest, and this, this graphic just shows you their expansion over, over their years. Uh, and since the 1900s, they've been expanding their range across, um, across North America, both, e both eastward and westward. And New York State's no exception. Uh, they had moved into New York State from the north and then have been expanding westward as well as southward. And this began around the 1940s. And as they've been moving southward, they've been increasingly moving into urban areas, moving into, into Manhattan, into the Bronx, into Queens, into these highly populated, highly urban, uh, urban areas. Um, and you can see here, this is a, a picture of a coyote on the top of a bar in Queens, um, just taken about three years ago. Uh, this, was, this was one taken just about a year ago. And so there's you know, a famous prison outside of New York, Rikers Island. Just, there's a footbridge that goes from Queens out to Rikers Island, and there was this coyote was captured uh, there on Rikers Island. You can see it's eating some kind of plastic container. Uh, it has in its mouth from some kind of food vendor. Uh, but there, they've been seeing there are reports every few months uh, of coyotes in not only Manhattan but also the outside outer boroughs. Um, and one of the interesting things was there was so one of our major airports, LaGuardia Airport, is undergoing a major renovation. And so they were building parking lots for employees for overflow parking in an abandoned baseball field. Uh, and so as they were doing some demolition, 13 coyotes just popped up and started running around. And uh, you know, sadly, they, they euthanized all of them except the one who's still at large. They, don't, they have no idea where he went. So good, good for him. But at the outset, Animal control thought they were just wild dogs. They thought they were feral dogs. They looked just like dogs. They had, and so one of my colleagues uh, who has a relationship with the animal control in the New York Parks Department got a call and said, hey, there are all these dogs. Uh, if you want to come take a, a look at them. And he also works at the Museum of Natural History. Uh, and so was able to go out. And we, ha we house them all now. Um, and this, this kind of spawned our thought of 
we know that they interact with dogs in other urban settings and thought maybe this is, this is the case. These guys look like dogs. Let's see if they actually share a lot of the characteristics um, with dogs that would be indicative of them mating with domesticated dogs in New York City, uh, which would be a really, a really phenomenal, um, a phenomenal thing to study. I mean, so just to give you an idea, hybrids, uh, when I say the word hybrid, that's the offspring of, of two different species. So you know, if you hear the word like liger or, ti or uh, I can't remember what the other ones are, liger and tion, the, like uh, if you made a, a lion and a tiger, um, you, you could get an offspring that may, may or may not be viable. That would be a hybrid. And so they share characteristics of the two parent, parent species. I mean, so coyotes and dogs are actually pretty closely related. Um, and the genetics of dogs, coyotes, and, and wolves, they all share some, some of their genetics with their, their evolutionary history is really mixed um, due to domestication, due to intermingling in the wild. And so they can produce viable offspring if they do mate with each other. Um, and so one of the interesting things in this system is that we hypothesize that hybridization of these New York City coyotes would act with dogs would actually give them attributes of a domestic dog that's able to navigate an urban landscape um, and might give them some morphological, some physical characteristics that allow them to eat the things that are available to them, uh, socialize, be in these environments, and not be predated upon by, and not be bothered by, by humans. Um, it was actually funny, those, those coyotes that were, came out of that woodlot, uh, at a baseball field, when they did their autopsies, they had hot dogs and like dog food. And, like people were feeding them because they thought they were cute and cuddly, and uh, and so that's also a, uh, another reason why they're able to pervade into these urban areas is because out in wild areas they're usually persecuted because people see them as pests. Um, but in urban areas, they're such a novelty uh, that people want to take care of them, and they kind of get adopted by neighborhoods uh, and they and they feed them. So we we sought out to look at. All the, as many collections of northeastern coyotes, domesticated dogs, and, and wolf skulls that we could find to do measurements on them so that we could compare those measurements to these New York City coyote skulls and see if they had any shared characteristics, more characteristics than you would expect just at, um, just at random. And so this was actually work that I had done with, with some high school students. Here's one of my high school students who's actually measuring a coyote skull. Uh, and so we measured them using this apparatus. It's called a, a microscribe. And all it does is it takes 3D coordinates uh, on any object, and then it can recreate those in, in some computer software. And so we chose 40, 40 landmarks on a skull, and so those are we measured the same spot on every single skull in, a, in the same order, as well as looking at the left mandible. Uh, and so we were able to do that for uh, between 48 and 57 skulls. And then we also digitized a couple of them using 3D models that we'd like to make available to the public uh, so that anyone can go on, go on a website and be able to download these 3D scans and um, be able to use them for their research um, and for whatever purposes that they, they see. So I just wanted to give you an idea of how this, uh, this kind of works. And so this is, each of these things is our 3D measurements of every single uh, cranium. And these are every single, all the points for each mandible. And what you have to do is then you have to line them all up on top of each other. And the process that you do for that is called a Procrustes analysis. And the, the interesting thing that, that I learned while doing this is that what Procrustes does is it takes an, and it measures the center point from every single point and then overlays all those center points so all the points line up. And the reason that it's called that is because Procrustes is a Greek mythological figure uh, who was a son of Poseidon and what he did was everyone who passed by the mountain that he ruled, he, would, he had an iron bed, and he would ask everybody to sleep over. And everyone who slept over, he would either stretch you or cut your legs so that you fit into his bed. Uh, and so any, any statistical method that now involves taking different shapes and then trying to superimpose them onto each other, onto a uniform set of, um, set of marks, is called a Procrustes analysis after the mythological figure. So I thought that was kind of an interesting, interesting thing. And so you can see afterwards, this is what they all, this is what they all look like. And so this just allows us to compare apples to apples. So we can compare the, the front of the, the mouth of all the individuals, and we, can, and we can compare the side of the orbital with all the individuals, and just lines everything, everything up. And so what we found was actually 
kind of the early signatures of hybridization between New York City dogs and uh, New York City coyotes and domesticated dogs. So these red dots are all northeastern coyotes. The blue dots are the New York City ones. Uh, the orange squares are wolves, and the green circles are domestic dogs. And you can see coyotes form kind of this group. Coyotes fall somewhat in between, and this is kind of a hand-wavy part of, of my, my talk, because we, we're still collecting data. A lot of these coyotes are still in our domestic beetle colony, getting their flesh eaten off so that we can actually measure their skulls. So this is still pre preliminary, uh, but these coyotes fall somewhere in between northeastern coyotes and domesticated dogs. And so we believe that this is showing some preliminary evidence of a hybridization. Um, and then when we look at the mandible, we don't really see any pattern with the mandible in terms of New York City coyotes versus northeastern coyotes, or even wolves for that matter. They all kind of are all jumbled together. So the, all of their mandibles look generally the same, whereas domesticated dogs are totally different, which is understandable because they've been domesticated. They don't have to eat things in the wild and, and hunt anymore. But one interesting thing you might notice is that there's a green triangle right in the middle of this coyote group um, that is a domesticated dog. And so when we went back into the collections, we were able to see that on the label it says Canis latrans, which is coyote, times familiaris, which is domestic dog. And so whoever collected this, you know, Mr. Thielman in 1961 believed this was a dog-coyote hybrid. And based on its, the morphology of its mandible, he, he could have been right. Um, or it was def or it was actually just a coyote that um, just just a coyote that didn't mate with a dog. But this is the utility of having all this collections data associated with our samples, and then being able to do contemporary studies to be able to look and corroborate some of this information. And so, like I said, the as preliminary evidence does suggest some hybridization, and we're still investigating this uh, from a morphological standpoint. So we still have a lot more skulls to measure. Uh, from New York City coyotes. Uh, we still have about 10 left, uh, plus all the new ones that get collected. Um, the interesting part about this and about why it's really important to collect this data is that it's really unique. This is a really unique system because we're able to catch and study the founding members of a population as it moves into new territory. And so these coyotes are moving into parts of, they're already resident populations in in the Bronx, um, and, and they continue to move downward through Manhattan and into Queens, and they're gonna continue to move out onto Long Island. Uh, and so this is really unique and able to get not only morphological data, to collect the individuals that are there that do happen to either be, a lot of our samples from New York City are road kills, um, and so being able to collect those and accession them into our collection so people can utilize them in the future. And this, this study is also supplemented, I'm also collecting genetic information on these individuals as well, um, and tissue and archiving that in our cryogenic facility at the museum so that future researchers can look at this um, and be able to look back in 50, 60, 70 years when coyotes are common throughout all of New York City and be able to look back at those individuals that started that population uh, and be able to look at their, their trends, their demographics. Um, it's, a, it's an incredibly exciting, uh, exciting study. And then the last, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about was actually using anthropological uh, collections for, uh, for studies. And so this is actually one of my favorite things. It kind of takes me outside of just looking at all the species that I study um, be, and being able to inform non-biological collections using uh, genetic techniques. And they're treasure troves of information. There's, there's a, a whole wealth of artifacts um, both anthropological and art artifacts that have animal parts uh, that have been incorporated into them to make them. And sometimes those identities are unknown. And so I'm gonna talk to you about two specific projects that I helped out with that were particularly interesting. And so the first was, uh, there was an expedition in 1935 out of the American Museum of Natural History called the Verne Hopwood Chinduan Expedition to Myanmar or Burma. And it was a three month expedition up the Chinduan River at that time, it was very understudied. People really didn't know much about the, the culture there. And it actually founded a lot of our biological and anthropological collections um, at the museum. And these are just a couple of photos that were taken uh, during, during that expedition. Well, one of the artifacts that came back from that expedition was this crossbow. Uh, and so, it, like I said, it was collected in, in 1935. And it's made of wood with some kind of fibrous 
um, fibrous part of it to hold the arrow and to, and to shoot it. And there's, it's hard to see in this photo, but there's a groove right down the center. And on that groove, the, the conservators had noticed that there was a bunch of dried blood in that groove. Um, and we know that on these, on these primitive types of weapons, they would lubricate the shaft of the arrow with some type of blood so that it would fly out of the arrow faster and being able to take down whatever they were hunting. And the collections had no idea what animal it could have come from. And so they, they called me and they were like, would you, would you want to come do this test? And so I went down there, uh, was able to scrape off a bunch of that blood into a tube and did, uh, was able to get some usable DNA and then able to tell them that it was actually chicken blood. Um, and which was a really, really cool thing for them because they, they had no, nothing written down about this. And this is able to inform their collections and they were able to add it to the data that's associated with this crossbow, helps answer questions about this culture, uh, and can inform, can, can yield a whole bunch of information about other cultures in the area uh, when they receive similar, similar things and when they go through these. And so this was a super cool um, project. And then a second one was using, uh, well, so the second one came about because there were a, an expedition in 1895 uh, out to Jalisco, Mexico, and it was, it was led by uh, a Norwegian explorer and ethnographer, Carl Lumholtz, who was actually one of the founding members of, of the Explorers Club. Uh, and so they went out to, to Jalisco, Mexico, and took a lot of ethnographic information, as well as brought back a couple of artifacts. So one of those artifacts that they brought back was a ceremonial shield. Uh, and so these shields, this is a, a front shield uh, that was titled the Mother Westwater Shield, and it has this serpentine embroidery. It was really, it's really beautiful, and all these reed sticks that are sticking out, holding it. And then this was a, uh, what they termed a back shield that warriors would use on, on their backs. Um, and these were ceremonial. They weren't used for actual protection. And what you can see is... On this, it's hard to see, but on here, it's a little clearer. There's these dark spots here and a couple of dark spots here, um, and the conservators weren't sure what it was. But Lumholtz, when he was down there, he took notes and said that there were ritualistic blood smearings on these shields, and they anecdotally knew what animals it was, it was from, but they wanted to definitively know. And so they told me all this information, and I said, sure, I'll do a DNA test. It's like, but don't tell me what you think it might be. I want to have no, no information, no bias at all. And so I went down there, and, and this one was a little trickier because this is all yarn and wool. And so I went down there with a couple of, of Q-tips, dipped in some buffers to break up cells, and swabbed it, put it in a tube, went back to my lab and did a DNA test. And from there, I was able to tell them that that blood came from white-tailed deer and was really pleased to know that that's what they had written down as the anecdotal animal that they used to smear these, these shields from, for rituals. Uh, and so it's, it's really a, a really fun part and a really cool use of collections uh, because it informs about cultures uh, and gives us information that we wouldn't normally know. Uh, these are just a couple of, of projects. I've also worked on some project with the Metropolitan Museum of Art where they had uh, an ancient Quran that I believe was about 500 years old that they had that was made with parchment paper and they wanted to know what uh, the animal, what the animal origins were. Um, and so they were able to give us some. And that one was actually shows the challenges. There we weren't able to actually get any usable DNA from that um, because it had been bleached and processed. And so, you know, collections are a great wealth of information, but also pose some challenges as well based on their preservation. And that's why it's super important for museums to now preserve their collections in a way that can be used in ways that the collectors never even could envision. Um, and so I wanted to just end with talking about some advances in how we can use collections and the exciting new ways that they might be able to be used for, uh, for DNA. I, as I mentioned, you need contiguous stretches of DNA in order to do, uh, in order to sequence it and get usable information. But over, in the last year or two, uh, there have been a lot of new ways to get information on populations of individuals from, from museum collections that are 50, 100, 150 years old. And one of, one of those processes is, I'll go over this quickly, and if anybody has any questions, it's, it's a little technical, but it's what, in our genomes, there are these stretches of DNA where enzymes will, will cut, and we all have the same one. So within all of us, if we treated all of our DNA with this enzyme, 
it would make cuts in all the same spots throughout our genome. And in between those cuts, there are areas that are really variable. And so even though it would cut in the same spot in all of our genomes, the information in between would be different between all of us. So it would be different between individuals. And so this technique has been really powerful for understanding the diversity of different species, but has been unusable for anything in the collections because those little sites that the that enzyme would cut are not there because that DNA is already chopped up. But a really cool thing is that people have been able to create a new technique where what it does is it is able to take that highly fragmented collections DNA and then kind of melt it onto high quality DNA from that species. So it would be, if I were doing my mountain lion study, I would get some of my mountain lion tissue from what I collected recently, extract all that DNA, and then use that collections DNA that's really fragmented up and use that high quality DNA from a contemporary animal as a, as a template. And it would just paste onto there and then I'd be able to look at all those variable regions in between. And so this really opens the door for being able to study things really, really in depth and at really high resolutions. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. This, is, these, this just came out in the last two years. Every, every year there's new technologies that come out. Um, and so this just highlights the importance of being able to preserve diversity in our collections for techniques that we don't even know can exist. Um, because who knows what's going to happen. You know, 60, 70 years ago when people didn't even know the structure of DNA, no one would ever think that we could get DNA from museum collections or DNA from anything. And now we're, we're talking about expanding that and getting DNA from things that are half a million years old, which is just absolutely incredible. Uh, and so I just wanted to end uh, with just highlighting some of these key points and hoping that I've convinced you that collections really are an important part of biological studies. And uh, not only do they inform about the history of different species, different geographic areas, um, and about our, our Earth, they're also important to make publicly available so that researchers all over the world can access this wealth of information and, um, and to go out and preserve our collections in a really sustainable way for uses that, we, that are currently unforeseen. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank you all for, for your attention and to all these people who helped make all of my research possible. And with that, I think I'll take any questions. Thanks.